have to wait until we get over yonder. There are some times we can have right here and right now. Hallelujah. So uh, thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And I've been looking forward to this uh, all week long, especially since I uh, had to miss Wednesday night uh, on short notice with, uh, with, with sickness. And uh, uh, I didn't want to scare you. Amen. I'm fine, but I didn't want to scare you. No, we're so, so thankful to be here today. In just a moment, we'll be going to the 145th Psalm. Uh, so many wonderful things happening. Thank you to all of our visitors for being here. And I, I was blessed today uh, to get to have breakfast with, with our most important members with our younger Sunday school classes. And uh, I learned all kinds of things. We have people, they ask me powerful questions like what's my favorite wood animal? And my favorite color? And my favorite fruit? In case you're wondering, mango is my 14th favorite color and my 6th favorite fruit. But... But I didn't know we've had kids here that have apparently milked poisonous snakes. I'm not sure about that, but, but I'm told we, we, we put together an, not just an air guitar, but an air band. And I got to watch their talent show. It was amazing. During the oddity of the last six or seven months, one of the things that has suffered the most, without a doubt, has been children's ministry. Uh you notice last week it was hard to find a seat in here. And we aren't near back to our normal number yet. We're headed that way, thank the Lord. One of the reasons we've had space issues is because children's ministry has suffered. While we're not having Sunday nights, we don't ever want adults to go through the week with a limited number of church services. So we had not been doing children's ministry every week like we normally do. But starting next Sunday, that's going to change. So, starting next Sunday, if you're 4 to 11 years old, after Sunday school, they'll be back in power hour. Our kids get to have their own service back. They don't have to listen to me anymore. Thank God for that. Hey, hey, hey. Um, now, normally, normally when a child turns 12 and becomes a preteen, as mine used to tell me, I'm no longer a child, I am a preteen. When I'm a post teen, so you can just get it. When normally, when they turn 12 and get to go to the youth group, they kind of leave children's ministry behind. But this crop lost six months of children's ministry. So the 2020 COVID special, the election year special. For now, for a limited time only, it's not just 4 to 11. Our 12-year-olds, and we got a bunch of them, can double dip. You can go to youth stuff. You can go to kid stuff. You can go to senior stuff if you want to. Just make yourself happy. So I, I want to say how thankful I am for everybody who makes children's ministry work. And uh, it's going to require a lot of shuffling for a lot of people because we're going to have a different crew every week. Nobody's going to miss two Sunday mornings a month while we're not having Sunday night service. Our Sunday school teachers have all agreed to make a sacrifice and, and teach on the last Sunday of the month. So uh, if you're not in that age group, it's probably not exciting to you. But if you happen to be or if you have to keep up with one of them during church, that's good news. Amen. Uh, the 145th Psalm, Psalm 145, I had uh, so desired to share this last week. And it has been on my heart and just just uh, uh, excited to be here today. Psalm 145 and verse 13. David is singing to God. And he says, Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Now that may not seem like much. But every now and then you need to step back and realize we live in a temporary country. Because all countries are temporary. We live in a democratic republic and I thank God for that. But they're all temporary too. We work temporary jobs. Some of you work jobs that did not exist when you were in high school. Jobs that did not exist when you were in high school. Some of our kids are going to work jobs that don't even exist yet. So rapid is the change in technology. But his kingdom's an everlasting kingdom. 
So the stuff we've done all week to prop up our temporary houses that will fade away and, and pass away and to, to extend our temporary lives and, and Lord willing to help our temporary country, what we're doing today is everlasting. It's an everlasting kingdom. And thy dominion, everyone say his dominion, endureth throughout all generations. The country may not care about what he thinks anymore, but he's still in charge. Thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. Now one more verse, Romans chapter 6 and verse number 14. Romans 6, 14. In the New Testament, he said, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. I want to talk to us today about distraction and dominion. If we had time, I'd like to talk about distraction, deceit, and dominion. But today we're going to talk about distraction and dominion. God holds dominion over all of it. There have been some strange things go down of late. But he wasn't surprised by any of that stuff. He holds dominion over all of it. And because God holds dominion over all of it, once I put myself in his hands, there is a degree of dominion that I now hold. And while I abide under His grace, sin need not have dominion over me. Now I grew up in a wonderful church that did not believe it or teach it that way. And it took me a couple of years of Holy Ghost and Bible detox to change my thinking. But we are not under the curse of sin. Nor are we bound to live in the midst of it. Let's ask Him to help us. Lord, I love you. I thank you so much, God, for your word, for your spirit, for your people, for this opportunity to gather together. And we ask right now that your hand would just be upon us in this place. God, that we could individually and collectively take one more step toward you. Lord, that you would work in us and through us and for us. Let your blessings flow freely in this building today. And have your way, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Let's just thank Him together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Every time the word dominion comes up in teaching and preaching, I think of the same story. I was a child and my mother had taken me to my first circus in Roosevelt, Colorado. Utah, Roosevelt, Utah. As a matter of fact, the Shriners kidnapped me and stuck me in their little car and rode me around the arena, and I apparently did not take well to that at all. Traumatized and horrified, every bad decision I still make is from that traumatic experience, no doubt. I was ready to leave, but I'm glad we stuck around because I was in wide-eyed wonder as a four-year-old boy just a little while later when a cage was lowered to the center of an arena. Another cage was rolled in, and a lion was let loose. In stepped a lion tamer, imprisoned in this steel cage, just a man and the king of beasts. He was armed only with a whip. I've seen them also with a pestle. But always everyone with a three- or four-legged stool. The lion tamer. Holds in that stool power. For when he placed it between himself and that crouching cat. He suddenly was in complete control. He's still no match for the lion's strength. He has no way to compete or compensate for its speed. The cat could tear him limb from limb. But mentally he's now more than a match. Because the lion by nature tries to concentrate on all three or four stool legs at the same time. For him, this is a physical impossibility. And in that instant, man has taken dominion over the beast. In his paralyzed state, he's taken dominion. Now so many of us have suffered that same fate spiritually at the hands of our adversary. 
And carnally, carnally, by means of distraction in this plastic spinning world that we live in. Our antagonist succeeds and sometimes our flesh in distracting us to look here and to listen there. So that we are rendered powerless from focusing on the one force that can really change our lives. That force is not earthly. It is heavenly. It's not a concept. It's an individual. But when we are distracted or deceived, that distraction renders us powerless to pursue that one thing that David, who wrote our text, said that he would seek after. So my mission's simple this morning. I've come to encourage you to turn the tables on your adversary or to refocus your own life, to redirect and realign our lives and take Take dominion, not just over cosmic powers or over Satan, but over our present sin and our self and our circumstances and our out-of-orbit society. It's not a new power and it's not a new concept that I'm challenging us to embrace. It's as old as mankind. It's as old as Adam and Eve in Eden. When God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let Him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth. And in the beginning, the Bible said, before our race was ruined by sin and separation from God, man had dominion over all things. Adam called forth the animals. They lined up one by one and he named them. He could call the beast from the field and the fowl from the air to parade in front of him. And he he named them each and every one because he had dominion over everything. He did not have that dominion because he was an impressive physical specimen or because he had achieved something some kind of mental sophistication or internal chi of energy. He had dominion for the same reason you and I do. Because God gave it to him. That's why the psalmist said, "If I can, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor and madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. He we have dominion where and when we have it because God gave it to us. But here and now, just as way back then and there, we have a demonic presence that seeks to deny us that dominion. And we have our own fleshly lust and desires that will distract us from that dominion that God has decreed and that God has ordained. And this is done again through deceit and through distraction. He plants subtle seeds of contempt and confusion and doubt and distrust and disbelief in our heart and causes us to forfeit or to not wield the incredible dominion that God had given to us. The devil, the serpent, didn't just walk up to Eve that day. Into paradise and proclaim that God was dead or false. There's no sense denying the obvious. She had walked with him in the cool of the day. But what he did do was pull a thread. On that fabric wrapped around Eve's believing heart. He pulled a thread. And put her on a path. Leading to her own destruction. His diabolical quest to cause people to doubt what is true. And believe what is not. It's never changed. He has at least 6,000 years experience. Satan came to Eve and ignoring all the bounty that was around her and the beauty and the supply and the grace and the glory. He suggested to her that the reason God did not want her to eat from the fruit of this one tree. He didn't want her to eat from the fruit of this one tree was that she would be like God. That was a lie. The truth was she was already like God. She was made in His image. Now I wish we had time to talk about this. Oh, well, there's so many rules in the book. And thou shalt and thou shalt not. That is absolute garbage. This is so much easier to understand than that internal revenue service tax code. 
But in the very beginning when God said you got one rule, the whole earth is yours, you can do what you want with it, it belongs to you, it's under your dominion, it's under your subjugation, you do whatever you want, it belongs to you except for this one tree. You can have anything you want except for this one tree, you can eat anything you want except for this one tree, you leave this one tree alone because if you don't you'll die and everything else is yours. And where does Satan find Eve standing? By the one tree. She could have moved anywhere in the world. She could have done anything in the world. But they hung out by the one thing God told them not to do. We've never lost that spirit. We push that line as far as we can. We were driving up the road on our way home from a memorial service yesterday and heading back to the house to change clothes for another function. And... Um, uh, Sister Moore informed me that we were entering an area where she had passed a state trooper every morning all week long. And then she told me exactly how fast she's figured out he'll let you go before that particular trooper pulls you over. Now we're not talking about what the law says, we're talking about what grace says. What tolerance says, she said, you're going two miles an hour too fast, you can go this fast. And you're going to be fine. And we know she's telling the truth because that same, uh, uh, that same trooper has pulled a daughter of ours over. We're not going to name any names multiple times in the last six months in the same spot. So I believe her because of her experience. Because of her. I want to tell you something. If you told your kids you can go in any room in the house except for that one, stay out of it, they'd all huddle together there and try to put their head on the ground and look under the door and figure out why they can't go in that one room. If you tell them they can play anywhere in the neighborhood but stay away from that house, they're going to be right on the curb just trying to get as close as they can without falling into the yard trying to figure out what's going on in that one house. Our problem's not laws or rules. We had one and we couldn't keep that. Our problem is is internal our problem is our nature and here this woman was arguing with the word of God Satan said if you eat the fruit you'll be like God she was like God but Satan succeeded in helping her start the engine of her own destruction because the devil did not want Eve to know who she was I want to tell you something the greatest battle we have in the American church is that we don't really grasp who we are one of the reasons some people have preacher religion if I could just get that one to pray over me if I could just hear him preach if I could just get that one to prophesy to me if I could make it to that service are you kidding me you have no idea who you are greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and when he filled you with the Holy Ghost it was the Holy Ghost so there are not two or three or four it is God's Spirit and after that moment there is something incredible and powerful residing in you that will work out into your life. He doesn't want us to believe that we are who God says we are. Our greatest battle in belief is not that God, believing God is who He says He is. Our biggest problems after our conversion. When we so struggle to believe that we are who God says we are. But I want to remind you of who this book says you are. Not because you're bright or thrifty or successful or special. And not because you've done some grand thing or got your whole life together. The moment you give yourself to Him, we are the sons and daughters of God. We are expected and accepted by the beloved. We are delivered from darkness. We don't escape it. We are delivered. We are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are the moment it happens, new creatures in Jesus Christ. We are chosen. We are kings and priests the apple of his eye the object of his affection we are complete in him and if we'll stop trying to complete ourselves and find that missing piece to complete our lives and start living to be complete in him he'll make everything else work and he'll make it work better we've got to know who we are now I've got to get there 4,000 years later Jesus is alone in the wilderness and he's tempted of the devil for 40 days in the mountains. He suffers temptations. Satan took him to a pinnacle and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in one moment in time. I wish we had time to talk about this but everything the devil had to offer he could show it to him in 60 seconds. He said all this power will I give unto you and the glory with them if thou wilt worship me. He said I'm going to give you 
the earth in return if you'll just worship me. But the fact is, the earth was already his. A thousand years before that moment, David said, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and the world and all that dwelleth therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. The earth was already his. The attempt was an attempt at distraction. If we're not careful, we'll do it to ourselves, our own distractions, our out-of-orbit society, or maybe the devil himself. If we're not careful, we'll convince ourselves that we are not who God says we are. And therefore, that we do not own what God says we own. We have redemption through His blood and forgiveness through His sins. There was a Cajun many years ago, not far from where the Longs pastored in Bro Bridge, out in the swamps of South Louisiana. And when power first began to be run to residential communities, uh, this lady, she lived way too far out, but her son worked for the power company, and, and so he got electricity, ran to her house. And he's going through things one day, and he asked the secretary, he said, Hey, uh, how's my mom's deal working out? And she said, You know, your mom only uses one kilowatt a month. One kilowatt a month. He said, what? So when he got off that day, he made the long trip out to the middle of nowhere and, uh, uh, you know, drove a road over to her house, however he got there. And he said, hey, Mom, how's the electricity working? She said, oh, it's amazing. He said, really? She said, every night when it gets dark, I turn the lights on and I can see to go around and light all my lanterns. I don't have to fumble around in the dark. When they're lit, I turn it back off. And, and he spent his evening trying to explain to her, you don't need lanterns. You don't have to risk burning your house down. What you've got is so incredible. It'll work any time. It'll work all the time. It'll work all night long. But here we are hoping we can get just enough of our spiritual head above water to light that lantern again. If you'd ever understand what you received when you received the Spirit of God, we're fighting things we don't have to fight. And we're dealing with things we don't have to deal with with they belong to the Lord we have redemption through his blood he forgave our sins we have an advocate with the father a measure of faith a treasure in an earthen vessel we have promises and hope beyond the veil a seed of resurrection in our soul an eternal city whose builder and maker is God we have dominion if we'll just embrace that and recognize that we don't earn it we don't pump enough iron or train how to combat it. This is hereditary. I have it just because I'm His. If we're going to learn to have and will dominion over sin and sickness and circumstances and Satan himself, it's as simple as knowing who we are and believing what He said. We are not who we think we are. We are not who our wicked world says we are. We are who God says we are. If I can ever believe that I'm who God says I am. And I possess what God says I possess. See, Adam was the world's highest embezzler. By one man's sin, death entered into the world. Through the offense of one, many became dead. By one man's offense, death reigned. The offense is one. Judgment came upon all. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. We know that. We understand that. But what we lost in Adam, we gained in Jesus. What Adam got you into, Jesus came to get you out of. And he came to give you dominion over all things. He put all things under his feet. I don't have to figure out how to put them on my I feed. I'm just a toddler who needs dad to put me on his shoulders because he's got the rest of this worked out. If we could ever understand this. If I could ever learn to see myself as God sees me. So many times as a young man. I'm still young, praise God. But when I was an even younger man a few decades ago. God would deal with me about things. Pastor came to me when I was 16 years old. He said, I feel, like, yeah, I feel like the Lord wants you to be the, the, the youth guy. I said, really? You know, I was 16 years old. Youth guy, I'm a youth. And he said, yeah, pray about it. I went to pray. I said, Lord, you got to help my pastor. He's lost his ever-loving mind. <laughs> that old guy, he's crossed over. He's got gray hair. He's in his 30s. I mean, I think he's lost it. Might be time for a younger man, but you know. 
And the Lord dealt with me powerfully, and I knew that's what God wants me to do. So I said, okay, I'll do it. I was talking to a friend of mine. He says, what's your plan? I said, I don't have one. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I have no idea. He said, he said, do you ever feel like you're in over your head? Oh, I know I'm in over my head. I've got no idea. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to pray about it and figure it out. But I know this, if it's what God wants me to do. See, this is God's kingdom and it's God's church and it's God's department. I'm not trying to climb a ladder. I wasn't trying to be a youth guy. I felt that again when the Lord called me to evangelize and to be a pastor. And I finally learned the secret. There is no secret. He knows what's going on. I don't have to have a clue what's around the next corner. I've just got to understand if I will see myself through God's eyes. He's going to give you the ability and dominion to do what He calls you to do so when you read a Bible verse and say I don't think I can do that oh honey yes you can if his spirit is in you he will equip you and enable you he looked at Adam and he saw a whole world he looked at a hundred year old childless Abraham and saw a whole nation he looked at a liar named Jacob and saw a Messiah he looked at a mass murderer and saw a deliverer he looked at a coward in Gideon and saw a conqueror he looked at David and he saw a king he looked at impetuous Peter and saw a rock when God looks at you he doesn't see what you do he doesn't see what I do he sees what he can do in the midst of you we're born with the ability to exercise dominion over sin and Satan and Lord, help us ourselves. Wish you had time to tell the story of the lost emperor's son. He was raised by peasants, war and turmoil. They thought they would lose the, the palace. Mom had handed him to a servant to flee, so at least the lad would escape the sword. Through a series of odd events, the emperor's family was victorious and remained on the throne. Took them nearly 20 years to find the boy, but find him they did. Identified by a birthmark and by a testimony. He wasn't even in their dynasty anymore. They had fled to another kingdom to escape the wrath of his pursuers. The nursemaid that had run with him had not survived long after the trip. And it took this peasant rice farmer a long time to realize that the power, the authority, the influence... It did not come from his upbringing, and it did not come from his abilities. It came from his blood. I want to tell you, it's not your power, it's not your might, it's not your voice, it's not your money, it's not your intellect, it's not your strengths, it's not your weaknesses, it's the bloodline. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have dominion for one reason. God said that I did. Today I am exactly who God says I am. I wish we had time to talk about it in Genesis chapter 5. It gives us a man's uh, uh, a name and, and, and then the length of time he lived and he died. And another name and the length of time he lived and he died. Genesis 5, 1 through 24. He lived and he died. He lived and he died. He lived and he died. But then came one man. One man named Enoch who stepped out of the mold of his ancestors. Who took dominion over death. Not because he had it to take but because God had it to give at creation when God wanted to create something he always spoke to its source to the essence of where it comes from when he wanted plants he spoke to the ground he said let the earth bring forth seed when he wanted fish he spoke to the sea and said let the waters bring forth when he wanted fowl he spoke to the firmament when he wanted cattle he spoke to the earth let it bring forth cattle and creeping things upon the earth whatever he wanted he called it forth from its essence from its source and, and, and he understood the connection to the origin of the created being when God got ready to make man he spoke to himself the reason he used the royal we and spoke to himself is because he wanted us to understand that if I want fish I talk to water if I want plants I talk to soil if I want cows I talk to grass but I wanted you so I talked to me 
Now for something to survive or thrive or produce or reproduce, it has to maintain its intimate connection to its source. I've said it like this numerous times in Bible study. There can't be a fish flapping around the gulf saying, Man, I've got red lobster trying to catch me. I've got barracuda trying to eat me. I've had it with this. I'm going to move to New Orleans and get a job on the docks. Get me a nice dry apartment and live the rest of my life on land. I don't know much about fish, but I know this. If you take them out of the water, they die. It's their source. There's not a Jersey cow or a longhorn steer in all of Texas that can say, that's it. That's my last summer. It's hot here. Horse flies. Droughts. Another steakhouse around the corner every day. I've had it. I'm going to crawl into the nice cool waters of the Gulf. I'll be a big deal in the Gulf. There ain't many things out there as big as me. I'm just going to spend the rest of my life paddling around. Enjoying the sea. I'm going to be the Jimmy Buffett of cows. He wouldn't make it. Because for a cow to survive... He has to stay connected to his source. Cows don't eat fish or chicken. Cows eat grass. You can pull a plant out of the ground and put it on a shelf next to 82 books about botany and it's going to die. Because for something to produce and reproduce and survive or thrive, it needs a connection to its source. So if you and I are going to thrive, if we're going to produce, if we're going to become, and if we're going to live in the dominion God gave us, we have to stay connected to our source. He made man with his hands, not his voice. But he breathed the breath of life into him. And when you're severed from the spirit of God. Working and living and flowing in your life. Of course you're miserable. Of course you're lousy. Of course you're unhappy. Of course you're uncomfortable. If you want to make it. There has to be a spiritual connection. We are washed and saved. By the regeneration of the Holy Ghost. It didn't happen one time. In vacation Bible school. I've got to be connected. It has to live and move in me. In Him we live and breathe. We move. We have our being. We are complete. And if you could read the 42 generations of Jesus from Matthew, my goodness, every sin and vice and backward relative imaginable, His family tree leads like mine on one side of the family. But when John got ready to give the genealogy of Jesus, he didn't talk about mama's side or daddy's side. He said in the beginning was the word. The same devil who tried to delude Jesus into accepting lesser life than what he had been born to possess tries to convince us to accept secondary blessings. He'll try to put your eyes on the contents of your first birth. But I have to remember I have been born again. I have a rebirth. I have a new birth. I have a second birth that cancels out my first birth. I'm not what I was. I am a new creature. And I have dominion over the life that I lived. You may have been through it all. You may have been an addict since kindergarten. You may have had 42 marriages before you got out of high school. You may not have been able to tell the truth to save your life. But when you come out of the water and you receive the Spirit, honey, you You are a new creature. Old things passed away and all things become new. We have a, I've I've read this list before and I'll read it again. My sister's a therapist and I, I thank God for people who do what she does. She was working yesterday on a Saturday and and I am not anti therapy. Some of you need more of it. And I love you. I've got a theory about marriage counseling. If either party thinks you need it, you do. Don't be the dummy that tells them, we don't need that. You're in trouble. It takes one unhappy person to have an unhappy marriage. Okay, changing subjects. 
I am not anti-therapy. I'm not anti-psychologist. I'm not anti-psychiatrist. Some people take pills that don't need them, but if you need them, take two of them before you come to church on Sunday morning. (laughs) I'm not anti-medication. I'm not. Now that we've got that out there, there is a bumper crop of therapists in our generation who are committed to the mushy mentality that we are not only victims, we are victims who cannot escape the influence of our victimhood and can never rise above our upbringing, circumstance, abuses and cannot become more. I would tell you that for free. And they've caused many of people that I love to fall into a false philosophy And live in such a way, and this is not, I I don't believe, the universal therapist feeling. But I've known some that convince people I love that basically they can't escape their past. They are who they are. And I want to be careful here. That the four boils of our flesh are all somebody else's fault. Everything wrong with me is because my diaper was too tight, my bottle was too hot, you know, and mom, was, uh, mom dressed me in the wrong color and the potty was too high and they didn't buy the right baby food. And multiple millions of people that throughout history in the past would have been taught to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and try to find a way to overcome adversity. And that's what therapy should help you do. Have become victims drowning in new... with fire but when I received the Holy Ghost that changed everything in me and somewhere along the line we're supposed to stand up and say I was an alcoholic I used to be a drug addict I was a liar I was immoral but I know what God did in me the Bible said let the redeemed of the Lord say so 
We treat symptoms from coast to coast, and that's okay. But we've got to get something inside of us where we understand, I am complete in Him. My problem's not loving people. I needed the Holy Ghost. My problem's not pornography. I needed the Holy Ghost. My problem wasn't my marriage. We needed the Holy Ghost. My problem wasn't my upbringing. It was the lack of a heavenly Father. I am complete in Him. If you don't live in the context of your first birth, but live in the power of your second birth, you can take God-given dominion over so many issues in your life. People who try to work it out without even inviting Him to the table. People who try to deal with it without even inviting Him to the table. I had a friend, I wasn't their pastor, said our marriage is in trouble. Thinking about just quitting church for six months and seeing if I said, well, time out. Your marriage is in trouble because your spouse cut Jesus out of their life. I prophesied that cutting them out of yours too will not make it better. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things shall be added. Oh, I wish I had time for this. There are people in this world that complain in their heart about attendance or worship service or paying their tithes or giving their time or making room to pray or opening their Bible and those same people used to move heaven and earth to get their next fix to buy another bottle to make it to the bar to, 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 to pay for their porn to make it to the club when you're forced to realize and come face to face with your past and truth here's the deal we all do what we want to do and we all make excuses for what we don't want to do there is power in the gospel and in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and we cannot fall into the trap of blaming our yesterdays for everything that we do not want to see get better don't surrender the hard won victory of Golgotha and the cross and don't hide behind your inadequacies the gospel is the power of God unto salvation and my rebirth broke the shackles of my first birth Let's stand together. When you're born again, you're born into dominion over Satan and self and sin and circumstances. Dominion. I never took spiritual warfare classes. We didn't have those at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Pearl, Mississippi. And even when I got the good old Holy Ghost... They, they never taught us, I didn't go to Bible college, but the, the, you that went learned this. I never went to a devil caster outer class. First time I ever had an encounter like that, all I had was the Holy Ghost and the Bible. So all I could ask myself is what did Jesus do and what did Paul do? Because that's what James is going to try. Nobody taught me how to do that. I know some people don't believe in in spiritual things and I don't know what you do with the Bible and particularly the New Testament but but you you know, it's real. I was having lunch with a pastor friend and evangelist recently and they were talking about a pastor who pastored the church where one of these pastors is previously and how when the previous pastor had died he was elected the previous pastor's wife sat down so you've got to understand there are some deep spiritual things that take place in this town and there's some stuff you've got to know this is real and he told her he said sister I don't believe all that gobbledygook and she said oh Bubba you will and his life story arced and ended in disaster so let me put you through the James Moore School of dealing with demonic spirits. James, the brother of Jesus, said, Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know what our problem is? We quote, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. That is not true. Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. When I say, God, I may not understand, I may not like it, but if this book says it, I submit. 
I'm placing myself in submission. Submission. Submersible. Submission. I am underneath the mission. Your mission's here and I'm here. It's more important than my likes and my dislikes and my wants and my needs and my retirement and my next vacation and my hobbies and my politics and my ball team. Whatever else I've got, Lord, it is underneath your mission. This is the primary thing in my life. Your mission. Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. If you've done that, you can resist the devil. And he, you don't have to win. You just have to resist. Well, you can't, if you didn't win, you're not resisting. Try that with a police officer. Resisting arrest. You didn't win. Resist. If I submit and I resist, God does the rest. Oh, goodness gracious, we've got to get this in our heart. It is the power of God unto salvation. The answer to a bad past is a good present. And it is important that we become convinced of our righteousness as it is that we were convinced and condemned and convicted for our sin. The righteousness comes from God. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, the Bible says. Let me read it again. We are complete in Him. If you feel incomplete today, the missing piece is not a person or a career. And all of that matters. I love what I do. And I love the people I live with. But completion comes from Him. I know people that have been married 13 times. They still don't feel complete. They're a complete mess. My completion comes from Him. I've read it to you before, Luke 10, 19. Jesus said, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I've told you this before. The first power is authority, and the second power is ability. He says, I give you authority over the devil's ability. The power in the police officer doesn't come from his arm. It comes from his badge. It doesn't come from his gun. It comes from his badge. The authority he works under. Usurps ability. See, the devil has ability. Harass, attempt, aggravate, torment, oppress. But God has given you authority. I wish we had time for this. In the Old Testament, God was a cloud in the desert to shield them from the sun's abuse. And at night, That same presence turned into a flame of pillar of fire to give them illumination and warmth. Because the same God, but whatever I need for the elements I'm in, that's what He is. And if I stay underneath Him, He'll be light when I need light, and He'll be shade when I need shade. He'll be power when I need power, and grace when I need grace. He is a present help in the time of trouble. He's a one-size-fits-all deity. And whenever the cloud or the fire began to move, they had to jump up and move with it. I mean, I believe in God, but you know, it's it's 11 in the morning on Sunday. I'm here. And one of the priest's jobs was to walk through the camp. Everybody had to camp with their with their tent flap facing the tabernacle, so when the cloud or the fire began to move, they could see it. And they had one priest who'd walk through the camp, and anybody whose tent flap was shut, he'd kick the stakes down so it'd sort of. What's the proper kind, churchy way to say collapse on their head? So they'd recognize, well, you gotta get up, get moving. You know what some of us need? Some of us are so distracted with what's going on internally. So distracted with what's going on in our world, in our head, in our heart, in our life, in our career. That if we're not careful, we'll miss the moving of the Lord, which is the answer to what's going on in our head and our heart and our life. Every now and then, we just need somebody to come by and sort of kick a stake. Somebody to come along and shake us and realize that I'm dealing with some things that God gave me dominion over. He put all things under his feet so if I let myself be taken into his arms everything I'm dealing with is under his feet can we close our eyes I know we're five minutes late 
want you to think about your present wrestling match. For some, it might seem a simple thing. Fear, uncertainty, worry, election results, the economy, disease. For some, it might be as simple as I'm trying But the truth is, I'm just having a hard time letting go of it and giving it all to God. I want His joy and peace in my life. I'm just not sure that I'm ready for everything that comes with that commitment. Perhaps it's right in the middle of that, since some secret besetting sin or some public embarrassing one. It's different for everyone. But you hear me. There is dominion in your life over sin for one reason. God said there was there's an answer in your life for one reason God said there was God said there was I could tell who was losing a fight when my kids were all little because whoever came to me they were the one in bad shape and they wanted me to give them instruction and words so they could go back and tell the bigger one Dad said It's my turn. That's my cup. That's my, that's my, that's my. If we could ever grasp the power we have in our Father's voice. We're trying to learn how to do things that He can do for us. And some things that He already has done for us. Dominion. 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 Do you have your thing? Do you know? If God could change one thing in my life, it would be this. If He could heal one thing in my life, it would be this. If He could deliver me from one thing, it would be this. Do you have that? I wonder right now, right now, can we just lift our hearts and hands to Him and give that to Him? God, I'm praying. I'm asking you right now to have your way in this house. Help us to believe that we are who you say we are. We are delivered. We are accepted by the beloved. We're the apple of your eye. You want to heal me. You want to help me. You want to deliver me. You want to save the marriage you want to save the kids you want to save the direction you want to heal the body but you want to heal the heart you want to heal the mind that is who you are you hold it all in your hands in Jesus name can we just step out and bring that to him right now in Jesus name can we give him an opportunity his dominion Come on, you got to be honest with Him. God, there's some stuff here my flesh really likes and holds on to, but I want you to deliver me.